Jim Hoogerhide is no stranger to speed. For over three decades, he's been chasing and breaking land speed records on motorcycles and streamliners alike. As a longtime sponsored racer for Top One, Jim's built a legacy one mile per hour at a time, pushing his machines to their absolute limits. Today, we're taking you inside his personal workspace in Sonoma, California, where innovation meets obsession. We're diving deep into the engineering marvel that is his record-breaking streamliner, the Nebula Theorem 2, a machine that is clocked in at over 300 miles per hour. That's right, over 300 miles per hour. From the front wheels to the motor, this isn't just a tour. It's a look under the skin of a machine built for one purpose, speed. Hi, I'm Jim Hoogerhide, world land speed record holder. I use top one oil lubricants for all of my racing needs. This is how land speed records are made. To start, let's take a look at the inside of the streamliner itself, starting at the front wheels. The front wheels are off right now, getting serviced. They're made out of billet aluminum. I'll pop one on just so you can kind of see where they sit and what that looks like. Is there some sort of uh, rubber tire that goes over this or does it no. run on aluminum? No, as uh, at the speeds we run, when we're running up near you know, 300 miles an hour, the centrifugal force on tires gets great. They just expand, expand, expand. The aluminum, well, it's not providing a tremendous amount of grip. These are just dead nuts reliable. They've been run on the car as high as 368 without failure. So we're going to continue to run them for years to come. It doesn't have any tread or any cushioning. How's the ride? Does it slip? Does it? That was my big concern at first. I was really worried that, you know, I would turn the wheels and it would just kind of skate. I would love to say it's, you know, this big manly event to, uh, you know, wrestle this thing down the racetrack, but it's really not. It goes wherever I point it, and these things have been fantastic. These aluminum wheels have been really, really fantastic. This is the cooling system. This is the water tank. It's a total loss system in that we're losing all the cooling. We're not pumping the cooling out, total loss. We have no heat exchangers. There's no radiator. On streamliners, the aerodynamics are supremely important. So bringing air in and back out kind of interrupts that that flow. So we just deal with it. We pack this full of your coolant and then some ice on top of that, run it, and we've had zero problems. Uh, is it a circula circulating system here or how, how does it work? It is. The pickup is down here underneath. The water pump's right here. It just runs a regular 12 volt water pump. Switch it on inside when we're ready to go. Explain to me how coolant flows into the motor and cools things down and gets recirculated. So from the water pump up in the front, this is sucking the coolant out of the tank and running all the way down through this three-quarter hose. Kind of snakes its way through. We're all disconnected at the moment, but normally this hose would be connected back here to the back side of the motor where it runs around through a water jacket, cooling the motor down. Comes out of the motor here, comes across into this. This is the inverter that converts the DC power out of the battery into three-phase AC power for the motor. This does get hot as well as the motor, but the coolant does a really good job of wicking the heat away, transferring the heat back into the coolant, and then coming back into this guy. Gets pumped out of the inverter, follows this hose all the way down, all the way back up into the front, and then comes into a little shower bar in the top of the coolant tank and sprays that down comes back yes. in so where the coolant is really doing its job is back here in the motor so the water comes in gets pumped back into the back of the motor here runs through a water jacket to help cool things down comes out the side of the motor connects to here so as the water comes through here it's hopefully removing some heat and then getting pumped back through this hose all the way up to the front to the water tank with electric motor power delivery if we delivered all that power at once it would probably never reach the rear wheels we would probably snap the dry shaft in half, we would break parts somewhere. So there's a ramp programmed in. So even if I made a huge mistake and just put my foot on the floor, it will slowly bring the power in and we dictate how fast that power is going to come in. So we're using your grease back in the CV joints because they, they rotate and pivot a little bit and they need a lot of lubricant. I change that after every race because we're racing in very fine silty dirt, which mixed with grease becomes a fantastic abrasive. And then we also have salt. Both CV joints are sealed, so we 
just pack them with your grease and run it. Any other areas on the vehicle that you use grease or? Yeah, we use your grease in the front wheel bearings. The spindles are out of an Anglia and the very basic hot rod front end spindle with taper bearings. How do you get in and out of the cockpit there? Or what do you call this? My office. How we get in and out of the office is Pete would first prep the seat belts by loosening them up, flipping them out of the way, get them up out of here, bringing the waist belts up, and then this is what we call the crotch belt, and he would flip this down here. And then we remove the steering wheel slash handlebars. I would be standing here and I'd put my hands with my gloves on on these this little white grip tape here okay. and kick my legs out and slowly lower myself down. Scoot forward till my chest is up to the first steering sprocket and then slowly kind of wiggle down and get my helmet and Hans device under the roll bar. And then I reach back up here, pull myself in. At that point, Pete starts bringing the belts over and bringing the lap belts up and starts to fasten everything together. I kind of wiggle around, get comfortable, make sure there's nothing really pinched or pokey, and then make sure I can reach everything, get my feet on the pedals, and then we start to tighten all the belts down. My helmet in here, I have roughly a half inch on either side, two fingers. If there was an incident, I don't want my head to have too much travel. Also, the roll cage is lined with SFI padding, required and very helpful in reducing shock load to the monkey in the car. I have an eighth inch of foam in the back, actually. And the rest is you're sitting on basically Aluminum. Aluminum. Yeah. Uh. Once the belts are very tight, Pete would hand me these again, and I'll, I'd put them on right there. They index in. That's a little okay. release. And then we start turning the gauges on. Does this show you how fast you're going? Yes. Or? Since we're electric, we have one gear. We are a direct drive. We have an output shaft coming out of the motor directly into a sprint car rear end. So it's, it's out right now, but normally out of this motor down here, out of this adapter, there'd be a, a 930 CV joint going to a very short drive shaft, going to another 930 CV. CV joint. There is no gearbox, it is just direct drive. Do you use a gear lubricant or something like that in there? We do. It's at your feet. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Why is it important in a direct drive? This rear end on a really good run, it'll spin somewhere between 10 and 12,000 RPM. The shear on that oil is tremendous. So we change the oil after every single run, no matter what. The biggest reason that we change it is to look to see if everything in the rear end is holding together. If we start to see bits of aluminum, bits of brass, we, we know we have a problem. These are El Mirage gears because they're relatively close in size to each other compared to our Bonneville gears, where this gear has very few teeth and this has as many teeth that fit in the housing. Why is that? We wouldn't be able to run as well as we've been running at both venues with the same gearing. It takes a lot longer to get up to 300 miles an hour. Yeah. So El Mirage, I want to get this to around 250 miles an hour. So our ratios change. Okay. Where at El Mirage, we want a wheel speed that's around 330 to 340 miles an hour to give us a, a time slip of 312. Those are the quick change gears. These nuts come off, this cover comes straight back and there's two gears that okay. change our final drive ratio. With the two straight cut gears in the back, yeah. they are just a big paddle wheel. Bringing oil up and all around and across the pinion, the ring gear back here, same thing. I have a breather here, so when it gets hot and expands and you know, does its thing, it can puke out into here. The overflow can come into this tank and okay. return to the gear side of the rear end. So to change the final drive ratio on the car, when we pull this cover out, we've got two gears sitting on two splines running out the back, and here's what they look like. The gear lubricant is probably at a level about here in the rear end, and so it is constantly splashing. And how much force is on those gears? Roughly 600 horsepower. So this is the battery we run in the back of the car. It is 98 series and 8 parallel, and what that means is that's how we've configured each individual cell. There's a total of 784 individual battery cells that we've put together in here to create roughly 410 volts. We're also drawing about 1200 amps at max draw, enough to power two city blocks. My whole house has uh, roughly 200 amps. We have more, yeah, in the car. So we connect this to the inverter. This is an emergency disconnect. Inside here is is a very large fuse, so okay. if anything gets a little out of whack, it trips. It weighs 647 pounds. It's comprised of 784 individual cells that we've configured out of a Ford C-Max, of all things. The hybrid batteries can charge and discharge much faster than a regular EV can charge or discharge. They're a lithium-ion battery. Each battery cell has its own burst plate in it, a fuse, fusible yeah. link. So that would hopefully prevent a thermal runaway. So if one battery gets hot, tries to catch itself 
itself on fire, hopefully it will burst before it catches all the other batteries on fire. This compartment here is where the battery lives. We lower it in off an aluminum gantry crane and a chain fall. Normally, all these electronics are sitting back here. We use a, a T2C from EV controls, and what that allows us to do is hack all of the Tesla firmware and tell the car to do things that we want it to do. It plugs in here, and then we use AEM, which makes a lot of components to use on different race vehicles that we use. And this is the CAN sensor. Think of it as a portal that controls the water pump, sends signals to the dash, does a lot of data recording for us. What is the weight of the vehicle without the battery? Just under 2,200 pounds. Reaching extreme speeds demands extreme safety. Let's break down the features that make it possible, starting with the fire bottles. Right behind the coolant tank, we've got the fire bottles. This is in case there's an incident in the car or in the engine bay. And we have two different fire bottles here. If I'm on fire, I hit one button and that puts the fire out. We have an incident with the motor or the battery in the back. Then we hit a different button and that will cool that down. So there's a spray nozzle here and it kind of showers down the battery pack. Working our way back from the fire bottles. Here's one, one nozzle that would spray me down if we had any incidents in the cockpit. This is a master kill switch so we can disconnect all the high voltage power. That's where we disconnect power to make everything safe. These are the actuators for the fire bottles here. When I'm in the, in the car belted in, I have wrist restraints so that if there's a really bad incident in the car, it tumbles or does what we call a pencil roll, that my arms can't fly out of this plane here. And then you hope the belts are tight. You know, my thighs or my butt is kind of on these guys and this is running and straight up. That's hooking to some of the, the, the rest of the, the, the waist belt here. The, uh, the puzzle yeah. as we'll call yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. We have a high speed chute and a low speed chute. At El Mirage, from 200 to 250 miles an hour, I can use one parachute and slow down relatively quickly. We have a boundary there that we can't go out of, and we call that the back door. And I have always stopped well before the back door. I've never even seen it. So this car, even at 2,000 pounds, stops extremely fast. The parachute can sit back here. There's two of them, one, one underneath and one on top and the tubes come out to roughly about here. And so while I'm driving, my hands are here. I just reach over, pull that, and that releases the first parachute. And then the second parachute would be over here. With safety engineered into every detail, the bike is ready for what comes next. But where it races can be just as critical. Let's explore the differences between Bonneville and El Mirage. Two different venues, two yeah. different types of racetracks. It's the same type of racing where we're racing for a top speed. At Bonneville, it's an average over a mile. An average from, you know, mile marker one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to five. We take an average of the distance that we travel over that mile, and then when we do it twice to back up a record, you take them, add it together, divide it by two, and there's your number. In an FIM event, an international event, they can have uh, whatever amount of real estate they have to get up to speed and then there is one flying mile with a flying kilometer inside that mile and they only have one timed mile to get it done. We're at El Mirage we only have 1.3 miles and at the end of that there is just a sh very short 132 foot timing trap. So we triple light triple light in 132 feet and that's your speed and that's it. There's no backup run, there's no average of two runs, there's just the one. How fast do you get up to speed then? At El Mirage we've gotten up to 227 miles an hour in 1.3 miles of dirt. There's more mental stress on me hoping that I'm doing everything right, managing traction. I still don't run traction control on this vehicle because I like to drive cars, I like to drive motorcycles. We know we will eventually but for now I'm going to keep having all the control and all the fun, we know it's an advantage to run traction control because we can get a computer to react to tire slip much faster than me. It's not a drag race, but it is a drag race. We just happen to have a five mile drag race or a 1.3 mile drag race, but we're still managing traction all the way down the course. Different tracks, different challenges, but one goal unites them, joining the exclusive 200 mile per hour club. Here's what it takes to earn a spot. The El Mirage 200 mile an hour club, uh, the nickname for that is the Dirty Two club. It's, in my opinion, much harder to get into than the Bonneville 200 mile an hour club. You have more opportunities to get in, but I still believe it is much harder to go 200 miles an hour in 1.3 miles of dirt than when you have five miles to give it a shot. To get into either 200 mile an hour club, you don't just go 200 miles an hour and get a hat. You have to break a record in that 
that class to get the hat. So the Southern California Timing Association holds the races. The process is you would go out and make your rookie run. As a rookie, you have to keep it under 150 miles an hour. After that, you go between 150, 175, okay. get that license. Between 175 and 200, get that license. Then it's two to 250 is the double A, that license. Okay. And after 300, you're unlimited. So the Bonneville 200 mile an hour club, you would break a record over 200 miles an hour at the Bonneville Salt Flats, and then you're inducted. I got in the 200 mile an hour club at Bonneville in 2013 aboard a GSXR 1000. We set the record just over 220 miles an hour. We went 200 miles an hour a lot between 2008 and 2013. I went 200 miles an hour every year. I just didn't break the record. As things have progressed, there's a 300 mile an hour chapter, which is a blue hat. There are less than 100 drivers and riders to ever get the blue hat. And then a black hat is over 400, and that is under 10. Land I mean, speed every, racing land speed. teaches you patience like a Buddha. Number one motto of Team Hoogerheide is must be present to win. You're not gonna win from the couch. You have to show up at every event ready every single time. Everything has to come together. Everybody has to do their job. It's a big effort. Thank you for checking out Jim's workspace with us and learning about the process of breaking world records on a streamliner. Like what you saw? Be sure to subscribe and give us a like to show your support. But until next time, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.